Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in Advocacy Arena. I am so happy to have with me today Walter Chandler, who is a candidate for Tennessee State Senate District 18. Hello, Walter. How you doing? Doing great, Dee. How are you doing this wonderful day? Wonderful afternoon. I am great, and um, I am so excited about interviewing you. We've had an opportunity to talk a few times, and I want uh, more of the audience to get to know you, what you're about. So um, tell us a little bit about um, where you're from um, and, um, you know, so that people have an idea of your background. Oh, sure. Not a problem. So, yeah, again, thank you, D. Again, my name is Walter Chandler, running for Tennessee. Uh, State Senate, District 18. So um, a little bit about myself, and, I'll tie, and it ties back into how I got here at this moment, both uh, running for office and where I'm living right now. So mm -hmm. I was born and raised outside of Chicago, Illinois, um, in a town called uh, Joliet. Now, uh, for folks that are uh, familiar with the Blues Brothers, you know, one of the Blues Brothers was Joliet Jake. The first scene in the wow. movie was outside of Joliet Prison. It's funny, now the prison is now actually a museum and a tourist attraction, but I digress. I do that a lot, too, so I'll let you know. Okay. But, um, you know what I'm saying? So you have Joliet Jake or, like, another famous, um, per, a couple other famous people I know from my town would be um, Rudy Rudiger. If you've seen the movie, the 90s movie about Rudy going to Notre Dame, he's from my hometown. Love fact, that movie. <laughs> No, right. It's a great movie. And trust me, I played a lot in high school. I promise you that, especially going to Catholic high school. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, I, I saw the movie so much, I almost I memorized it. it. It's so <laughs> Man. I know, right? And um, Quiet is Kept. I actually went to school with a lot of his uh, nieces and nephews. Because really? the Rudiger family, oh, yeah. The Rudiger family is a big family. So, um, yeah, and they've had a lot of kids. So, Rudy, Rudy, um, he was in high school, I want to say late 60s, early 70s, was about his timeline. But, you know, he had brothers and sisters and cousins, and they all had family members, too. And they all had kids that were um, born, you know, even a decade later. So, yeah, I had, matter of fact, one of my good friends from high school, um, she was, um, she's a Rudiger. And, um, yeah, and he has, anyway, I'm digressing, not about him. But, yeah, just telling you about uh, Joliet. So, yeah, Joliet's pretty well known. And surprise, it was surprising to me, too. More people I talked to when I actually dropped Joliet, they're like, oh, yeah, I've heard of Joliet. You know, there's yeah. tons of small towns around Chicago and everything. And Joliet's not a small town. I think it's the third or fourth largest city in the state. But um, but still, it always surprises me when I can mention Joliet as opposed to having to say Chicago land area. Mm -hmm. um, but that's about me. Now, when I got to Illinois is actually part of the bigger conversation we've had in America about the Great Migration. Because mm -hmm. my parents were born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. And I would say, like, my dad, take about my parents, they basically went Tennessee, 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 Chicago, back to Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee. Okay. And in that 19, 20 year window where they weren't living in Tennessee is when they're living in Chicagoland, living in Joliet. And that's mm -hmm. when I came about. So, okay. I'm the baby boy. You know, I'm the youngest of four sisters and everything. And everybody else is <laughs> born down in Tennessee or Virginia, but I'm the only one born in Chicago. So go figure. But um, <laughs> and uh, we moved back right after we moved back to Tennessee. So they, my dad was on the tail end of the Great Migration. And then I want to say he was at the front end of the remigration down south of black folks moving back down to the south because when we got back here to tennessee in 98 um i wasn't meeting as many people coming from other parts of the country other transplants you know as opposed to now you know i go to the grocery store today you'll see license plates from other from illinois california regularly in parking lots and talking to people mm -hmm. so um so yeah so you have the my roots are from tennessee matter of fact my roots not only from my parents uh, they go deep down Probably my 200 years back. Matter of fact, my county that I'm living in currently, Sumner County, which is also my um, my senatorial district. My hometown. My hometown. Shout out. Shout out to Don Trousdale County, too, and, and, uh, and Sumner County. Uh, I can trace my roots back in this county 200 years back to two of the bigger slave plantations here in the county. The wow. uh, Craig Font and the Fairview. And just to give you a little history lesson on that, okay, the, the owner of the Fairview, his name was Isaac Franklin. It's actually one of the largest slave traders in the history of America. I okay. know. Exactly. I used to be on the museum board for um, Sumner County. So I know wow. a lot of um, our local hometown history. So I, um, it warms my heart when, you know, other people know it too. So. Oh, yeah. And I love I loved sharing the story because it more shows just the determination and just shows how, 
how long black folks, black people, and how long a how long we've been here, and how long the strife and struggle that we've gone to you can get to this day. Mm-hmm. So it trips me out, even even though right now I'm not elected yet, right? I'm still running for office. And I'm going to have my primary start in voting next Friday, um, on Friday, July 12th, I should say. Um, it still trips me out thinking that, you know, my family members, my ancestors came from slavery, came from being slaves on plantations up here by the biggest slave trader in the country, one of the biggest slave traders in the country, who mm-hmm. also owned the Angola plantation over in Louisiana. And a lot of people know it commonly today as the Angola State Penitentiary in Louisiana. So right. um, I come from that. And, a wife, and his wife, Aladisha Hayes, who commissioned the building of a mansion at Belmont University, of what now is Belmont University, also using her slave labor from up here in Southern County. Mm-hmm. So you have, when you know your roots go that deep into the history, into the foundation of this country, and we survived it. You know, my DNA survived to the point that's passed down to me. Even part of my name, you know, goes back to um goes back in my family history about my name my name that I have. So um it, it it's a it's a source, it's a source of pride of just overcoming. Okay? Exactly. Resilience, now, celebrating resilience. resilience. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. It shows the resiliency of my DNA, of mm-hmm. just the resiliency to keep striving forward, even though the system is set up to bring you down or destroy you. But um, right. I'm again. I digressed off into that. I just kind of finished up my story about myself. Um, so moved back to Tennessee. I go to school in Florida. I went to got a, my undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. Now Look I at talk that. We're black. talking to a rocket scientist. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, got it. Matter of fact, got a, My um, concentration was in astronautics, which definitely means about space, satellites, rocketry, all that stuff. But surprisingly, mm-hmm. my career haven't done much of that. I've been more commercial aircraft, and we'll get into that too. So, okay. um, graduating with my degree in aerospace engineering and astronautics, um, my career has actually been more focused on um, engines, whether it be military engines, where I started off initially testing for the F 35 engine, um, mm-hmm. whether it be working commercial side, the other side of my co- uh, other side of the company, working in commercial on um, 787, working on the Boeing 787. I actually did work on the Boeing 737 Max, but not on software, not on the impact <laughs> system. Um, I worked on hard on hardware. I worked on the floor beams and the frames inside the aircraft. And the floor beams, essentially, every seat is connected down, bolted down to something. But what's bolted down to, I help design those things. So, and design <laughs> where the sitting and where the seats are and how close the seats are based off the specifications that the airline wants, et cetera. So, no, it was not. My 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 engineering is why more seats didn't fly out when the door blew off. <laughs> I that's hear because, you. That's, you should have said so. Um, but currently, what I do now is now um in my nine to five, I work, I do troubleshooting and I do custom technical services with airlines. So uh, essentially, if you're at if you're in the airport or you're in the plane and you hear your plane your flight's delayed because of mechan- because of a mechanical issue, you're talking to somebody like myself. So that way they can help them troubleshoot to figure out what's going on and get your plane um, back to normal and back in the sky. Because airlines don't make any money when the plane's on the ground. It has to be flying right. somewhere. So, so, yeah, that's kind of my history of background as far as my career. What brought me back to Tennessee or has me in Tennessee. And um, honestly, what brought me back to Tennessee was my mom's health. Her health declined and I happened, was able to move back home to help her in her last season of life before she transitioned. And mm-hmm. um that's what brought me to Sumner County about three years ago. And when I got here, that's when I started learning about my history. Because I've always been kind of the genealogist in my the, mm-hmm. the new school genealogist in my family. So as I started tracing my roots and understanding about my family history, I'd already knew we'd come through Sumner County. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, wow. Matter of fact, I even found a street up here with one of my uh, family names on it. You what? know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Not too far from my house either. Yeah. That's when I drove awesome. Past, I was like, yeah, because I know I know the I know the white slave owner that brought the family here to Tennessee. I was able to trace that back too, because they started in Kentucky. He came down here around 1813 with some slaves, and then the first family member that was born um, in slavery here in Tennessee was uh, was born up here in Sumner County in 1840. 
All right. That is yeah. awesome that you have been able to do that genealogy and, and have an understanding and, and to be able to like now be there and to see it and to connect it. Um, I love history. I'm, I'm a history nerd. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> I appreciate you letting us know how you got to my wonderful hometown. Uh, but mm-hmm. I mean, really your family started there as did mine. And mm-hmm. you know, I've had a few, you know, uh, I've, I've lived around, moved around a few places, but, you know, home uh, kind of like you back because of my mom and, and family and that kind of stuff, wanting to um, be near them um, because um, I was in the military, spent, you know, um, about a decade in Germany and um, came back to... Yeah, well. uh, yeah, my uh, my youngest was born there, so you know I came back. I said so you had fun. <laughs> exactly, come um, and you know get to know her family here, and um, so now um, I want to find out why you decided to run. Uh, what what got you into politics? Oh man, well, I can I can pinpoint the day I became excited and uh, wanted to know more about politics. I was eight years old. It was during the 1988 uh, presidential election year, which had Michael Dukakis as a Democrat running against George Herbert Walker Bush, who was the vice president at the time. And I remember that damn commercial with Mike Dukakis in the damn tank. And I, <laughs> even at eight years old, I said, he looks stupid. He looks silly. So I'm like, I see this man. Didn't really know him from Adam, but I just know I saw him in the tank. I saw him with his, with his tie on. So he's not even like in military fatigues or military jacket. No, he's just wearing his you know, suit. And I'm like, dude, you look stupid. This is oh, wow. so if I'm eight yeah. years old, can huh? Yeah. So I'm like, if I can recognize this at eight years old, you know what I'm saying? I can only imagine what adults at the time were thinking. But from that point on, I became, you know, interested in about okay, who's the president? You know, I understood um who my mayor was in my town, Joliet. I knew what this is also the back end of Harold, um, of Harold Washington being the first black mayor of Chicago. So always kind of had a political tingle in my leg, you know, from the young age and really got turned on in 92 with the election of uh, Bill Clinton. And um, and also at that time, um, the schools would have a thing called a Channel One. Kids of a certain mm-hmm. age know about this. We, around lunchtime, you have the basically um, kid produced news, children produced news. And um, one of the famous alumnus is uh, Lisa Ling. So I know if you've probably heard that name, she does a lot of, P- she, I think she's won multiple Peabody's, worked for CNN, you I know, et cetera. I love her work. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she came from Channel One. So I remember watching her as a, you know, nine, well, I would say 11, 11, 12, 13 year old, 50, all the way through high school, watching her on that show. So, yeah, it's, um, so I've always been into politics, you know, started as a youth. And as I got older, just that knowledge of wanting to understand the government, understand, you know, elected officials and um, has always been there. I've always been kind of the source for political news in my family, even my circle of friends. So Mm -hmm. when it got to the point here that um, I was actually living in Connecticut, one of my mentors was telling me, Walter, I don't see you retiring from this company. I see you being involved in politics, probably running for office. I told him, like, I like all my elected officials. I don't see where I'm going to jump in at. He's like, "Mm, I see something happening. And then, like I said, you know, unfortunate circumstance for my mom becoming sick with her dementia brought me back home. And um, once here, I went to a meeting trying to go to uh, become a delegate to go to the Democratic National Convention because it's going to be in where? Chicago. Right. So from going to that meeting, you know, um, I got asked, do you want to run for office? And I thought about it. And when I did my, you know, 48 hour think about it and pray about it and talk, reach out to a close couple of friends and family, everybody was like, yeah, like, this is what you've been waiting for, Walter. Yeah. What? Yes. Matter of fact, I had people asking for my app blue before I even knew how to set up an app blue account. They're like, let me know. Where's your website? Where's, where's your app blue? Let me know. I'll donate. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. That so, is awesome. Um, so having that support just from the, from the start, let me know, bam that, yeah, I'm in the right spot. And as and I'm doing what I was destined to do. And I would say that my life experience, to kind of quote Jay-Z talking about, you know, you you, rate, you, you wait your whole life to make your first rap album or your first album. Mm-hmm. I've waited my whole life to run for, to run for office, and this is it right here. And I see on a daily basis as I'm out on the campaign trail, as I have meetings with um, people like UMSD or I talk to constituents, See, yeah, my life experience has built me for this moment in this time in this location, because whether it be aspects of me being I thought that 
my first concern was being considered a carpet bagger saying, oh, you know, from around here. Well, yeah, my roots are here longer than yours. You know, mm-hmm. I find out as I start talking to people that there are a lot of transplants that have moved here because a lot of the growth that's happened Uh-oh. in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Yes. And for those who don't know, Nashville has exploded in growth for the last going on 15 years now at this point. Yes, and um, the city's become so saturated with the new growth, it is now spread to the collar counties, which means that you have people moving into the area that are a lot of people from transplants. So when you start meeting all these transplants, now I can talk a transplant story because I've lived all over the country. I lived in Illinois, Tennessee, Alabama, Kansas, Florida, Washington State, Connecticut. You know, I've lived everywhere. So mm-hmm. when I talk to people, whether it be somebody who has roots here in the community that's been here for decades or generations, I can relate to them. If I talk to people who have moved here recently, but they even, you know, at some point have transplanted from someplace else in the country, I can relate to them and have a conversation with them. And it also has given me an opportunity to have different conversations with people in my life experience from different backgrounds from different areas of the country. So therefore, when I go to talk to people, it's very easy for mo- most times than not for me to find a point of connection with somebody. You know, Absolutely. I went to the truck. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about your your platform and, and then we um, I want to get into um, a little bit more of um, a discussion around what the community that you're running in is like. I mean, I know it because I grew up there, um, mm-hmm. but I want other people to understand what that community is like and how that affects how you run your campaign. But first, let's hear what your platform is for your campaign. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for that. So my platform has four pillars of it. It's uh, education. It is managing growth, Mm -hmm. uh, growth management. It is uh, gun safety and it's healthcare. Okay. And that's okay. the big four. Now, we can break them down a little bit, and I'll try to be brief with each topic, each platform topic that I'm talking about. So in education, so right now in um, Tennessee, we have a, there's a big push by the governor for school vouchers. We don't want that, you know, right. because the top of, not only does it bring, take money out of public schools, which is already being underfunded more times than not, but you have to understand when you get out here to rural parts of the state and rural counties, like I have a rural portion of my county. Mm-hmm. Um, the school is actually one of the larger employers of that town or of that of, of that area. So now you're telling, now you're taking money out of people who are working there, you know, not just the teachers, but not just the administrators, but people, the janitorial services, the cooking services, you know what I'm saying? Please, all the people that use the, that the school as a source of employment, now they're going to lose a job because of money taken out of schools. Whether mm-hmm. it be our school, our, our state government just last year passed a law allowing teachers to be armed. Concealed carry in schools is ridiculous. We're so trying to, you know, I want to, yeah. And you talk to parents. And again, I'm in a very red district. I'm in a very red part of the country in a very red state. They even think it's too much. Even though people I talk to they have their guns in the back of their cars, have their rifles in the still the stereotype of having people the gun rack in the back of the car still exists around in my county. Exactly. <laughs> and like I said, I grew up there. Those are my memories. My uh, father is a farmer and, you know, like I, my childhood memories consist of him and my, my granddad being in the, you know, the truck with them and, you know, the gun rack and, you know, my dad mm-hmm. still has a huge gun rack, you know, in the living room. It's, it's standard. Mm-hmm. We're not um, unfamiliar with them or afraid of them, but there's something different that's yes. happening with guns right now. It really is. And I think what it is, is that people don't talk about is that I find that a lot of responsible gun owners don't want to acknowledge how many unresponsible gun owners there are out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I was talking to one of my buddies yesterday who lives in um, lives down in Huntsville, Alabama. And I was telling him um, we were talking about how Louisiana just passed constitutional carry down there. And my friends were like, OK, we're not so much tripping on the fact that's constitutional carry. The problem is you're going to have a lot of more um, broken in cars. You're going to have a lot more car break ins because people use the cars as they're safe because they don't use they don't believe in gun safety storage or the two days. I mean, in Tennessee, they would give you a free safety lock when you purchase your when you purchase your gun. If you but you have to ask for it, they'll give it to you. You know what I'm saying? Not a problem. Um, But people don't want to do that. You know, Tennessee's even made the step of trying to uh, at least make it tax free to purchase a gun safe. We don't want to do that. They're like, no. And instead, they'll leave it in the, the side panel or the center console of the car. And matter of fact, my boy was like, yeah, I went to the gym yesterday. I saw somebody open the car. You can see the gun right there in the door. You're like, dude, 
And and here's the thing, as I and the and the, the kind of dissonance that I find with having people with these conversations, whether it be this or other areas, is that you can see Hold on. <laughs> that's fine you wear a lot of hats and dad yes. is one of them and i love that yes. you're talking dad <laughs> yes i'm talking yeah that's what son do so um, one of my two boys i have uh i have a uh, son um yeah six and four but um okay. let me, again digression i told you i digress a lot going back I, to it funny. but um when it comes to the gun talks even with them i find that i'm like listen just dealing with my kids Perfect example for my kids. At some points, you know, there are times where you discipline both children, even though it was only one of them that 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 caused a problem. You know, you being in the military, I'm sure you've had experience where somebody in your unit messes up, and to make it to make an example, they make the rest of the unit suffer the consequences, while the person who actually did the problem gets to sit there and watch the unit take out the, take the punishment for them. It's so, standard practice in basic training in the army. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So I find we have conversations and not through the media, but actually conversations with people, responsible gun owners, you say, listen, I know you know how to take care of your pistol. I know you keep it clean. I know you I know you go to the range often. I know you, you practice often. I know you're a sharpshooter, all the good stuff. But we also have to know is there are one too many who are not being as responsible as you. And therefore we can try to do some safety measures so that way we can increase the level of safety, not so much to impede on your rights to own your firearms, all the ammunition you want, but to make sure that the people who are not responsible like you are not setting up to cause other issues, i.e. violence, or in case of, like I said, break-ins or broken in cars, which still affects you, the, the affects you, the um, responsible gun owner, not only in the gun side, but now it's going to raise your insurance cost for for, uh, for your car because your insurance company is going to say there's too many broken in cars around here. We have to jack up our prices, jack up our prices to, to cover that. So even though you haven't done anything wrong, and you don't have anybody in your family that does anything wrong. Other people doing wrong are affecting you. So again, we talk to people like that. It finds a point of contention. You're like, all right, cool. We can agree on that. You can agree on that? And you're like, okay. And that's all I'm trying to do when I have conversations with people is find a point we can agree on. Because mm -hmm. even though we may agree or disagree on everything else, if I can at least have one point of reference we can agree upon, then I know we can be cool. We can have a conversation. And at next, and there's always opportunities to expand at that point. Because right. we can use that one point we agree upon, build a relationship. Along that, you know what I'm saying? Professionally, professional relationship or friendship relationship. And it opens the gateway to have further conversations to both expand for both of us, because, you know, what I'm saying because I'm not right about everything. And I don't believe the person I'm talking to is going to be right about everything. But right. we can have conversations where we can come to, together, at least on something. And now it's OK. You know, we both agree on this. OK, so if we can agree on this, then everything he's saying can't be crazy because we agree on this and everything. He can't be a shill over here for that because I do agree with him on this. You know, and I use that in conversations and it's been very helpful and powerful when being out here on the streets and out here canvassing. That's awesome, because an interesting uh, point of note, I know you know, but just for others who may not, um, is that the um, county that you are living in and, and running in has one of the uh, country's larger gun manufacturers um, oh, right located mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. That is where our governor... Um, sign the um, one of the uh, major bills around mm -hmm. gun legislation there at the you know at the plant. So mm -hmm. you know, and so, it's yeah. crazy again. Even the gun topic. Last thing I want to talk about the gun topic. It's just funny because when you talk to them, when you, again when you talk to people who are gun owners, which there are plenty, um, and you tell them what laws they're being passed and being passed to your name, even they look at it kind of like what. Like when you tell them, like, does it make sense to be able to carry a gun into a bar? They're like, uh, no. <laughs> you know, all the bars on Second Avenue and Broadway, and you like want people walking around open carrying or even concealed carrying in that environment. They're like, yeah, probably no. But obviously, if somebody else can have it, I'd rather have mine with me. But the law being that, I'd rather us not be able to have guns mixing alcohol and guns. Um, right. You ask them, do you think a teacher? I ask them even when it comes to um, um, they're trying to pass another law. About uh about gun safety and trying to and trying to force kids to um get uh gun safety training in school right now they mm -hmm. say that well, what's wrong with gun safety we should all want that I'm like that's true but 
if at the same time you say if you have the options of parent to opt out of your child learning sex ed in school, sex education in school, because you'd rather teach it yourself for whatever reasons, I'm not just for I don't whatever reasons are your reasons, not, that's fine. No judgment. Yeah. No judgment. Exactly. No judgment. Then why shouldn't I have the option if I want to teach my child gun safety at home because I know how to handle these guns on a more daily basis and therefore I can show them exactly what to do as opposed to them getting taught to the teachers. And they're being taught this without your permission and you don't have the ability to opt out like you do in other areas of discretion. So is that fair? Does that make sense? And they're like, no. And I'm like, see, a point of agreement. But no, it's exactly. had nothing to do about taking away your guns. It had nothing to do about coming after your Second Amendment rights, the fear monger of Second Amendment rights. And it has nothing to do about saying that you can't own whatever whatever firearm you want. You want an AR? Cool. You want a 30R6? Cool. You want a, you want a SIG? You know, go get what you want. I'm, I'm cool. Just be responsible. And because a couple aren't, we're going to change little things over here. But I went way deeper into guns than I wanted to. And it's actually, and that's probably, like I said, my third plank in my platform. My biggest one Second biggest one, after education being the first, mm-hmm. is managing growth. Okay, because let's talk, talk about to, that. Why is that important yeah. to you? Because it, it's it's a catch-22 with this, you know, and it depends on which group of people you're talking to. So you talk to one set of people, the growth, um, they're concerned about not having a place to live and being priced out, or they've learned now the lessons of what happened in Nashville and how they gentrified Nashville. And how um, you know they came in a house that the grandparents probably owned or the parents owned, they never had to pay for. They come in, a developer comes in, offers them a check for you know three hundred thousand dollars. They're like, wow, three hundred thousand dollars? And I don't, I don't do anything to the house. That's great. Okay, I'm sold. And then they find out three hundred thousand dollars now moves you two hours outside of the city if you want to live, you know, to live in Nashville. Mm-hmm. They have other people that you realize that um, they've moved here, transplants have moved here from other parts of the country. And they wanted the big open space land that they've always dreamed about. And now they see the growth is impeding on their dream home and dream ranch they didn't have. So it's about, it's again, it's another area of opportunity to paint in the crowd of trying to focus on saying, listen, you're not stopping the growth. The growth, that the, the, the charm of what brought you here to Tennessee is bringing other people to Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, Tennessee's not the only one dealing with growth. You can go look at other states too, in the South, Florida, Texas, Georgia. They're all saying the same thing. They're tired of people moving in. But the stuff that you like, other people like too. And people, the stuff that's popular with people is going to attract people. So what we need to do and what I'm here to do is listen to you and trying to find where we can find the best of both worlds. So that way for people that want to stay here, who have been here, that you don't get priced out or that you have affordable housing to maintain. So you can stay here because you've been here way longer than the new person coming in. And for people who've moved here because they want their dream house and their dream land, saying, okay, but we're going to set it up so you can make sure you have generational wealth set up to continue not only with you, but all of your offspring, kids, grandkids, you know, et cetera, behind it. Because there is an opportunity with this growth to make a lot of money. There can be developers making a lot of money as they're building up these apartment complexes everywhere. So so I tell both sides, you can complain about it, you can fight it. My opponent. His response to that is, well, I'm going to let you fight yourselves out, spend all your money in lawsuits, and in 20 years, we'll eminent domain it and take it anyway. And we'll build up around you. We will build up around you while you fight it. And then once you run out of money or you run out of time, we'll come back in because we're the government, eminent domain, and take the land and circle that whole circle up that we, just, that we just created. That's what he's talking about. I'm being honest with you saying you can't stop the growth. You can't stop people from wanting to come to a good thing. So therefore, let's find ways so we can maximize opportunities for you to benefit from it. And I find that goes a long way of talking to people. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting that you do understand your opponent's uh, take on this and, and his attitude. Someone who is, you know, like a native Tennessean. So I've uh, known him and his family a long time. And I think a lot of people um, who have been here, um, seems like I'm having a little bit of connection, but who have been here are having this kind of same attitude they 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 want to bring all this change and they're losing sight of what is you know like what has made it attractive and um so uh, growth is really important to you and i i think it should be because it is happening whether we are paying attention to it or not and i think it is important that we have lawmakers in place who understand what's happening who's who's trying to manage it we can't stop it it's here it's happening 
mm-hmm. but manage it. And because, you know, I, I now live in the Nashville area and I um, see and know how it has affected certain communities here um, and it has priced people out of their areas, out of their homes and, you know, like um, not providing other resources to to make up for that pricing out and and that having to move out and and transportation and those things come along with the two which um you know having grown up in that area I understand like Tennessee rural areas like this don't typically have great transportation Tennessee just doesn't have it at all there I mean mm-hmm. you have to have a car in these areas like this mm-hmm. and I um hope that we can get to the point where that changes. I hope to live to see t- that change um, some. Um, and it's coming because it's forcing, it's forcing it to come because um, I saw what was about a decade ago now where the um, previous me- um, where me- uh, Megan Berry, when she was still mayor, tried to pass it like $2 billion infrastructure bill to bring in mm-hmm. rail and to bring in um, more busing and transportation, essentially make Nashville the city that it's growing into by four. But because people were complaining about traffic. And um, then I watched how they fear mongered both sides of the conversation, you know, to keep it from yeah. happening. You know, there, it was, there it was, was a political um, money involved, like um, dark mm-hmm. money involved. Oh, I'm yeah. talking Coke, Coke money that had oh, a, burners. yes, that spearheaded a campaign to confuse voters on the issue, uh, that transportation issue, when it came mm-hmm. up, to get voters literally to kind of vote against their own interests by the way they framed it. But yep. um, we have another bite at the apple here. I think people are a little bit wiser. We have another great mayor here. And we yes. also happen at this time to have a wonderful admi- uh, federal administration in President Biden and VP Harris who are providing lots of funds, opportunities, and encouraging expenditures in the infrastructure around the country. So this is a sweet spot for us. And I hope that we can, you know, grasp it and, you know, really do the right thing with it and, you know, help everybody. I agree. And that goes back to even um, partially why I'm running and what we can do to try to benefit the people. Is I think my job as elected representative is to give you, let you know the resources. I think half the reason, I think half the time, the reason people do not believe in government, let's say they don't even know what services the government is available for. All they hear about is taxes. They hear about all the negative stuff they don't like about government, right? And they never hear about the stuff that the government actually does that you like or stuff that's that things you, you go about in your daily day of um, living that actually government assisted you, you don't even realize. Or you right. find out that there are programs or services that are available to help when you're struggling that your representative is supposed to let you know about. And our representative here, our state rep- our state senator does not. He's even told people. He's told, matter of fact, I had one of my uh, friends who's also running. Uh, she's running for state rep. She went to try to reach out to him one time. And his staff told her specifically, you know, Senator Hale is not here to do what's best for the people of Sumner County. He's here to do what's best for the state. And she said, excuse wow. me, can you repeat that? She's like, yeah, the senator is not here to do what's best for his constituents. He's here to do what's best for the state of Tennessee. I imagine a lot of Sumner Countyans would like a word with him about that because, you know. Which goes why when you talk about this man, you mention this man's name to anybody. Forget political affiliation. You mention the man's name and I let them know that I'm running against him and they're supportive. (laughs) And if it turns out they're conservative, they're like... Yes, they don't like the man. I mean, there are a lot of Republicans who will vote for him just because he's a Republican on the ballot. But I've had Republicans, when I was going out to get my candidate petition signed, I had Republicans assigned on my petition. They didn't have to do that, especially when I'm announcing them, a Democrat running for office. They're Republican and, they don't, and they're like this. Why would they assist a Democrat to get on the ballot? Because they recognize our current senator is just not the guy. He needs to go. You know, say, hell no, he's got to go. Exactly. And I know that area that um, um, there are a lot of sane Republicans in that Mm -hmm. area. And so if you can get out and talk to people, as you said, because it is a rural community, when you start having these conversations on a personal level um, with people, 
um, you can speak to them and help them to understand that, you know, your platform is one that they can be supportive of because, you know, it's in line with um, their thinking and, and their views um, of what they want for their community. Um, you just, it all, it's always just tying it back to them, letting them know how you have skin in this and how it's going to affect you, whether you think it doesn't affect you or you know it does. It all affects you. Like I just pointed out with the guns and about how it can affect your insurance rates for your car. So it can Absolutely. be more expensive for your, your car. It can affect your employment if you're working out in rural towns like Portland or Mitchellville when it comes to trying to um for school options. You know, mm -hmm. it comes to it plays in about the fact that people who live in the southern part of the district, in the southern part around uh, Goodlettsville and Hendersonville and Gallatin, who do a lot of community back and forth to Nashville, it matters about the fact that the roads and congestions are really bad around here and about having the roads fixed and about having the um, 386 widened to, to allow more traffic to flow in and out of here. It matters to them trying to go north, the fact they can't go on 386 and go northbound on the I-65. So you point that out to them and like, dude, it's affecting you, regardless of parties, it's affecting you. Excuse me, regardless of parts, it's affecting you. And I'm trying to go there and I'm trying to make sure the, the positives that can happen and be an advocate for you to make sure your voices are being heard and make sure that we're trying to make the county what we need it to be and how it's growing and manage it to grow. And that goes whether it be educating, making sure we have the next generation of kids that are smart and educated properly to be able to handle the um, to be able to handle workload or be able to be a positive impact to the community. And it has to go with making sure you have health care, health care access. Another platform I didn't talk about, I mentioned earlier, it makes sure you have access to doctors, you know, and how they're with the policies that they make in targeting the LGBTQIA community. You may not, you may not like trans students or trans people. You may have problems with that. You may have if, issues, differences about people, about women's re reproductive health, right? But you know what? As a man, we need to go. To, we need to go see your doctor, and your doctor's not available because they left state because they're worried about going to jail because they're trying to treat one of their uh, women patients, that becomes effective to you. That affects you. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, not to mention the aspect of abortion. Abortion is still an issue. You know, mm -hmm. abortive care is still health care. And a lot of people get that. The media won't ever talk about that because I actually thought initially that uh, abortive care wouldn't really be um, um, a popular subject, something I could talk on around here. They're like, no, mm -hmm. lean into that. It's important. Abortion's, abortion's important. We understand it. And I have any little stories about that too? Let me give you one real quick. Okay. I had a friend of mine. She was uh she was older, uh, and I say older like was she thirty? She wasn't forty yet. She's late thirties, right? Mm -hmm. So she's advanced stage for uh for becoming pregnant. She's been trying for all life to get pregnant and everything. Finally went through IVF, multiple rounds of IVF, and got pregnant. Now two weeks after she got pregnant, sent me the card showing that she's had her first ultrasound. She got the call from her doctor saying, you have to go have an abortion. She said, why? Because you have stage four breast cancer. You need to start chemotherapy immediately. Oh, and it was either, and it was either you start, it was either you go have the procedure done now, to, you know what I'm saying, the abortion, so we start chemo, or you start chemo and the chemo is going to kill the baby and possibly kill you in, as, as well too. Now, do you know what I'm saying? So we... So, and unfortunately, you know, she, she had the reproductive, she had to have the abortive care done. She went through chemo and unfortunately she didn't come succumbing to the cancer, but so sorry. it goes back to, I appreciate that. And it, it, yeah, it hurt a lot. <laughs> it has been about, damn, when was that? 2017. So we're talking seven years ago now. It felt like it was just yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but when I, when I talk to people and I tell them, I'm like, listen, that's just one story. We have Abby Phillips who's running for U.S. Congress yes. out of um, Clarksville. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? She has her own health care story. She has one of the more infamous ones about having to travel to New York, having to travel out of state because she was about to die. She was going septic and was about to die and had to go have a board of care services done and had to go do it by herself. You see what I'm saying? And, and that's just two stories out of thousands that are happening. And unfortunately, they're going from thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And before we can get this bill, before we can get a board of care services directed at the federal level, I have a feeling it's going to be millions of women who are affected negatively, possibly even dying as a result of these, the result of these anti-abortion bills that have been passed along states, including ours here in Tennessee. So I'm trying to exactly. fix that. 
Yes, exactly. Because um, uh, to quote Simone Sanders, uh, because someone um, speaking as someone who actually have a womb, abortion <laughs> is health care, regardless of what uh, folks like the Heritage Foundation um, like to say. It is health care. You know? <laughs> Heritage Foundation that doesn't that Donald Trump doesn't know all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, uh, you've covered I think most of the um, your platform and and given us a little peek inside that. And I'm so glad again to have an opportunity to learn more um, about it and to learn more about how you're being received and the community. So that bl- brings us to, you know, kind of the, the wrap up. I want you to, you know, what is it that you want people to to take away to know about Walter Chandler, um, you know, what he, he brings as senator um, to the 18th district and how they can help you get there? So what I'm what I'm hoping to bring to it is my three my three pillars. I'm here to listen. Everything that I talked to you about today, as far as my platform, as far as conversations that I've had and share them back to you, comes from listening, listening to people. So I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to lead while I'm in the Senate. Not doing what's best for the state of Tennessee. I'm trying to lead, be a leading advocate of the voices of the people here in District 18 in the Senate. And then I'm trying to deliver. Mean deliver results back to you. Now, those results may be past legislation that directly affects some of the county in Trialsdale County, or it might just be making sure you're aware of stuff that got passed and information and services that are not available to you, opportunities available to you. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to listen, I'm here to lead, and I'm here to deliver. Now, deliver results. And how you can help me do that, if you could, is by checking out my website at uh, walterchandlerforsenate.com. And that's spelled F O R. So Walter Chandler, W A L T E R C H A N D L E R for Senate, F O R S E N A T E dot com. And on there, you can also donate to my campaign as well, too. There's a donate page there, there's donate links there all over the website. So please contribute, please contribute to donations to the campaign because that is the lifeblood of the campaign. It helps me get flyers out. It helps me get signage out. It helps me make sure I can make sure I get to these events so that way, whether it be the Moss Creek 4th of July show or the White House 4th of July show or the books, the um, back to school book drive we have coming up here in a couple of weeks over here in Gallatin, and make sure that I can be present at all those activities along with helping grow a team to help outreach the entire county. But I got a whole county. It goes from state line to Nashville. That's a big area. And two counties right. at that. So I need help. I need funds, and that help not only comes with manpower, woman power, it comes with financial power as well, too. So if you could, WalterChandlerForSenate.com. You can find my act blue on there. And you can also opportunity to join up and we can see, get you on phone baking, canvassing, or do whatever we need to do to make sure we get myself across the finish line to become unique state senator from uh, District 18. Well, thank you again, Walter, so uh, so much for being here with us. And you heard him, folks. Go to WalterChandlerForSenate.com. Um, help this man uh, become our next state senator from District 18. I feel that um, being from that district, that he is someone that will rep- uh, represent our community well, someone who understands our community and who will listen to the needs of the community. So I'm very excited about your campaign, uh, Walter. I'm very invested in your campaign. So I was very sure. excited about you uh, coming to talk to uh, to me uh, here in Advocacy Arena. And I want to try to help get as much support for you as um, you uh, to bring you across the finish line as I can, because as I said, um, I have a personal investment in it because I still, most of my family is still there um, in yes, that area. I'm very in touch with your family as well. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they are helping you out. I keep nudging them and nudging them and telling them, and, and they're very excited. All of them that have met you are very excited about um, you running. So um, we want to see you get there. Um, and um, any last words before we close out? Yeah, I, I, again, first off, D, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to talk to you and, and speak to your platform and share my platform. Um, you know, this is history making. You know, I'm the first black person running in this district. I'm the first black Absolutely. man you know, running. So let's, let's, you know, I don't like to, I don't like to lead with that, but I don't want to overlook it as well either. So we're trying to make history Absolutely. right now. So, uh, you know, make sure you're registered to vote. Check your voter registration here. 
um, state of Tennessee or in your representative state, because people who live outside the state, we start early voting here in Tennessee for our primary um, July 12th, which is next Friday, depending or it's Friday, July 12th. And that runs for two weeks before we have our August 1st primary. So please, folks, hey, it's go time. Let's go. You know, it's right. time to, we're going from red. We're taking this district from red to pink to purple to blue. Let's make it happen. There we go. I hear you, Walter. Thanks again. Thank you, folks, for joining in with this. Please go visit Walter, Walter Chandler for uh, Senate.com. Uh, uh -huh. All right. So we'll see you next time here, folks, in Advocacy Arena. Have a great day, Walter. Thank you. Peace, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.